Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, this talk, which is uh, a deep dive into an ORM, uh, into specifically the Entity Framework Core Query Pipeline. Uh, a few words about myself super quickly. So as uh, I was already introduced, I'm an engineer. I'm part of the team that actually works on Entity Framework, so I'm going to talk about sort of my day-to-day -day job. I'm also the lead dev of NPG SQL, which is the Postgres.NET driver. I kind of do a lot of stuff around Postgres for .NET. If anybody needs anything, come see me afterwards. I'm totally a hardcore Linux guy. Uh, I work on Linux. That's what I do all day long. Uh, and I'm based in Berlin, in case anybody cares or it comes to Berlin. Uh, so what is this talk about? First of all, this talk is not about a low-level intrinsics, GC, JIT, runtime. I feel like I should apologize, because in this talk, it's almost like a disappointment. But I hope, uh, I hope to show you that it can be interesting even if we're not talking in assembly and intrinsics and all that stuff. Uh, yeah, It's also not a talk about the new EF Core 3 feature set or anything like this. Uh, you can read the blog post or the release notes. I don't think it's worth spending our time over this. What we will do is do a very, uh, I think, quite a deep dive into what actually happens inside the ORM. Uh, Peter uh, talked, for example, uh, did some sort of dive into the GC. Um, Matt this morning did also a dive into uh, some, some areas of the runtime. I think I really liked what Matt said at some point. You have to always know, that was a nice quote, you have to always know one level behind, uh, underneath you. So I'm guessing a lot of people here have had a chance to use an ORM and so on. This is going to be a little bit about this. So we're going to dive into that layer that you're using. Uh, a lot of you are using, I think, uh, you know, in some sort of permanent way. And we're going to actually look inside the belly of this beast. It's quite a beast. It's very complicated and see what goes on inside. There's going to be a lot of architecture. And of course, this is .NET OS. There's going to be a lot of performance as well. You're going to see how they, they're kind of intermarried. Let's do a very like a very quick kind of getting started before we really dive into it. So ORMs, uh, in this context, they allow, without them, we'd have to do two things which we really hate doing as developers. One is write SQL. So the problem with writing SQL is not that we have to understand SQL. Uh, one of the big problems with it is that we would be writing SQL in strings, you know, in our program. It's not checked by the compiler. We change some property or some column name. Everything breaks. It's not a good way to do stuff, to, you know, integrate strings in your database and so on. And in general, sometimes it's good to, the, the idea of ORMs is to delegate the responsibility for this task, which can also be quite complicated, to a component that is supposed to know how to do it. Uh, the other thing that's very important in the context of this talk is materialization, which is, I'm going to focus specifically about the part where, fine, I sent the SQL to the database, now we have to read the results back. When a database sends results back, it's, it comes like in some sort of table, which doesn't at all correspond to your objects, which you have in your program, to your POCOs or whatever your types. So you have to do this thing. There's an impedance kind of thing. You have to read all this you know, crap from the, t the table data that you get back, and you have to construct materialized entities from it. Nobody wants to do that stuff. Uh, a few words specifically about .NET, ORMs and .NET. So C Sharp is a bit special because C Sharp has Link. Link is, frankly, one of the great features of you know, C Sharp. It has been there for a while, and it, I still consider it like a very amazing thing. Uh, Link, the, the whole point of Link is that we have, uh, sorry, we have uh, Link as language integrated query. Link defines operators, which we can use to express queries. We can run those queries with the same operators on memory objects, but we can also use them to describe something that will go to the database. So this power of using a native C Sharp statically type compile time verified query operator set and to use that over, a, over like a SQL database or anything of that sort is frankly quite amazing. In other languages where something like this doesn't exist, an ORM typically will have to define its own operators, right? So an ORM has a set of functions where we use stuff like where and order by these standard link operators. Over there in, in other languages, many times an ORM will come with its own set of functions and it's, it's a completely different world. One gotcha, one thing that you have to remember is that link can express an infinite number of queries. This is a very big headache for us at EF Core. There's a huge space of possibilities of what you can express. And a very uh, restrained subset of that is actually translatable into SQL. And I'll add one more thing. Even within the things that are translatable, many times you cannot translate them in an efficient way. So there's stuff that isn't translatable at all. You, can't, you cannot express it in SQL. And there's stuff that you can maybe express, but you probably don't want to because it's really going to slow you down. Just 
kind of reminding uh, things. EF Core, just really a few moments. EF Core is Microsoft's recommended data access technology. It's the ORM that is basically receiving uh, uh, you know, active development and innovation at the point. It's not the first one. Microsoft previously had linked to SQL. Uh, in that sense, we are standing on the shoulders of giants completely. This is also uh, something that is, so linked to SQL is more than 10 years old now. Uh, there's also EF6, Entity Framework 6, which is the predecessor. It's still there, it's maintained, but it's no longer receiving any sort of you know, innovation or, or moving on. Um, we just had a release with .NET Core 3. We also have EF Core 3. The query pipeline, which is the main focus of the stock, just got rewritten. So it's kind of like a nice occasion to actually talk about what happens in that thing. Uh, and one last thing, contrary to most ORMs that you're going to see, and also the other two Microsoft ORMs there, EF Core has as a goal not to be only about relational databases. It's not just about SQL. EF Core as an architecture has this split. There's a basic part, and then there's the part that's about relational databases. What this means in practice is you can use EF Core to interact with databases, which are, for example, NoSQL, a Mongo uh, database. There's an in-memory database that you can also use. There's absolutely no SQL involved. This is kind of an interesting concept, and it's, it's going to be a little bit important. Um, OK. I'd like to dive right in. Uh, just a quick show of hands. How many people here have actually worked with the c -sharp Expression Tree API? I'm kind of interested. Wow. I'm actually quite amazed. I didn't think there would be so many. So I'm going to breeze through this. I'm not really going to breeze through it. A lot of people haven't, so I'm going to actually explain it. But it's good to see so many people have seen this. Code. And presentation is measured by how quick it gets to the first line of code. So what you see here is something very trivial. You have a lambda. This is something, a compare. So it's a lambda that receives one integer parameter and returns whether it's bigger, larger than five or not. Just scalar code, no, no intrinsics, no vectorization. Very simple stuff. We assign this thing into a function. This is sometimes called a delegate. In any case, it's a function. Compare is a variable of type function, which receives an integer and returns a Boolean. This is super trivial, C sharp. I'm not going to even spend another thing. What most people don't know is that on the left side of that line, we simply enclose the function by an expression in the generics. We just add another thing. Everything else stays completely the same, and something completely magical happens. Instead of compiling a delegate, which is what happens in the beginning, which we can simply invoke, what happens now is that the C-sharp compiler generates an expression tree for us. This is not code. This is not something we can run. It's not IL. It's not assembly. It's nothing of the sort. It's an actual hierarchy kind of structure that represents that code. All right, That's very, very important. It's a representation of that logic. What we can do with that representation is compile it. That's the second line. And at that point, we do have the function. I, I left out the generics. We have the exact same signature as above. So we got to the same thing we have in the first line, but via a more complicated means. If we want to complicate this further, here we use the compiler services to actually generate this expression tree. It's a weird thing. But we can also generate it ourselves. We can use the explicit um, expression tree API. And it looks something like this. That's pretty ugly already. I'll go through it quite quickly. So the first thing that you see here, we have to generate something called a parameter node. Now we're, we're in expression trees, right? So there's going to be a node of type parameter. Everything here works as a factory. So expression.parameter returns a parameter. This is just how it works. Because the lambda has a, a parameter, so we generate that thing. Now, our compare expression, the second one, is a lambda. So we create this thing, again, via a factory. Its body is an expression node of type less than. So this represents the less than operation here. It has two operands. It's a binary expression which has two operands. The first one is the parameter, and the second one is the constant 5. I hope everybody understands how this ugly kind of thing maps to this nice and concise kind of thing. In practice, they mean the same thing. We also have to give the lambda the actual parameter. That's just how the API works. If we visualize that, we have this kind of structure. Once again, a lambda node targeting referencing a binary expression of type less than, which itself basically represents a comparison between parameter and constant. Once again, we can take this and compile it, and we're right back where we started. Okay, Hoping this is completely uh, obvious to everybody by now. What is this good for? Why am I talking about this? The first thing, this is actually, you can take this home and use it right away. Uh, unlike the rest of my talk, which is more about internals, this is actually useful stuff. This is usually used for code generation. It's a great solution for Perf. Uh, instead, so what typically you're going to do, let's say you get some sort of 
you know, configuration or user input, you can use this ugly kind of API. It's actually not that ugly, I'm saying that, but it's kind of okay. You can use this API to construct an expression of what you want, the logic, and then compile that thing. And in runtime, this is super important, the compiler will generate that code, which will run almost as basically as efficiently as if you wrote it yourself. Think about this when you do, uh, you know, when you do this kind of thing. When you have a very hot piece of code, a very perf sensitive piece of code, you can sometimes speed it up, only in that case, don't do this like in general, but you can speed it up by encoding the exact logic you want as an expression tree and then boom, you compile it, all right? Let's just compare this to a few other alternatives for code generation. I'm just kind of, this is like a, an introductory thing. Of course, we have Roslyn, which is the beloved C-sharp compiler. We can use Roslyn from a C-sharp program to actually compile something. Roslyn operates at a pretty high level, so it represents source code files in C-sharp. So it has even all the white space and the comments and all kinds of crap we don't really care about, right? That's not what we, what we want. So the job of Roslyn is a bit more high level but you can really do anything with it. Notably, with Roslyn, you can uh, generate classes, assemblies, entire assemblies, and so on. Expression trees are much more limited. You sh typically, you're gonna use it to generate expressions rather than, say, a big, big function, although that's also possible. Another alternative is something called T4. I'm guessing not a lot of people have heard about it. This also operates at the source code level, but it's basically a template language. So you write a C-sharp uh, file, and inside you have, if you use Razor or any sort of templating language, it's basically the same. You can integrate stuff, and you use it to co-generate. At a very, very, very low level, we have something called Reflection Emit, which is an API for generating IL. Uh, I really hope you don't ever have to use this. <laughs> it's pretty rare. If you, if, you, if you need to use it, it's because there's something you cannot express in C Sharp, so you're forced to go down to IL. This is a very, very rare case, but it's possible. An expression tree is in a very snug, comfortable kind of place somewhere in the middle. So it's actually a pretty cool API once you get used to it. Finally, getting closer to our ORM world, it is expression trees are also the basis for something called a feature of the language, once again, again called iQueryable, which probably not a lot of you know about. It's plumbing for ORMs and things like this. What we've seen up to now is taking these expression trees and compiling them into a delegate, which we can then invoke. Cool. But what iQueryable allows us to do is to write a provider to write a piece of code that instead of compiling and invoking that thing, it's gonna get it as input and execute it in some other way. Typically, an ORM is gonna take this expression tree, convert it, translate it into SQL in some way, do a sort of transformation, and send it to the database. This is what an ORM does. It's basically an iQueryable provider in this sense. This is what the query pipeline is. Hoping this is all very clear, so I want to jump right in and start talking about some problems when we translate from the world of link to the world of SQL. Okay, what kind of stuff are we going to hit? Let's look at something very simple, right? Let's call this null semantics. So if you have this link query, you see we have a, like a, a, a thing called employees, kind of like a database table, and we have a where uh, operator, and we're comparing the first name to the last name. So we're searching for all, all employees with an identical first name and last name. Anybody here read uh, Catch-22? Who am I referring to? No ideas? Major, major? No? Nah. Anyway, doesn't matter. <laughs> I tried the joke, nobody got it. Uh, usually, <laughs> go read Catch-22, it's a great book. Usually, the, uh, I mean, the thing, a naive answer to translating this into SQL would be to translate it to this. Select from employees where first name equals last name. This is wrong. It's a very, very uh, typical kind of beginner's mistake for people who have not really had a lot of experience with SQL. SQL has what's called three-valued logic. In normal, you know, in C-sharp and other normal languages, you've got true and you've got false. In SQL, you've got true, false, and null. It's really a three-valued logic system. It works in a very different way. Comparing first name to null will never give you true, even if first name indeed is null. It will not give you false either. What it will give you is, of course, Null, right? This is why you have a specific operator for testing if something contains a null. It's a very, very different world from C Sharp. Here we have our first big mismatch between these two worlds. So translating an equ a simple equality, this is the most basic thing you could imagine, we already run into a wall, all right? So uh, now this is like a point of philosophy. Uh, what EF Core tries to do in general, and it's a decision, is to try to provide the same behavior in the database in the SQL as the user would expect in the C-sharp program. 
because we're using link once again and not a dedicated operator uh, you know language set coming from the ORM like in other languages because we're in link there's a natural you know we, we have a natural um, um, expectation for the code as we write it to perform the same way as if it ran against objects in memory right makes sense that's not trivial if we want to do this if we want to mimic the C sharp behavior we are going to have to write something like this this is the actual correct 100% correct translation. You have to check if first name e is equal to last name or if both of them are null. I hope everybody understands what's going on. Anybody with just a little bit of SQL experience understands this very well. Other people, I mean, I'm guessing it's going to be okay. Note, I, I'm hoping, note that if one of these columns are non-nullable, we know that in the database schema they cannot accept nulls, then we can optimize this away, right? It, it, it is enough for just one of these columns to not be to not be capable of having null, and then we no longer need this check, and it's enough to just se just check first name equals last name. So we now can use information that we know about the schema and the database to maybe optimize this query a little bit. Just giving you a, li a, a bit of an idea of you know the kind of stuff that we do here. I want to give a counter example to this idea of mimicking C# -sharp behavior. It's a best effort thing. For example, is this Comparison, first name equals last name. Is this case sensitive or case insensitive? The answer is it depends where you're running. Different databases have different behavior. The, the, the most awful thing about writing an ORM, as opposed to, for example, something like ASP.NET, is that you have to target different databases, and each one of them, believe me, has awful quirks and you know arbitrary behaviors. It's an awful world. But just the fact that you have different providers is already quite awful in, in many, many ways. So already, different databases are going to work in different ways. Now, we could have guaranteed a case, uh, for example, a case insensitive thing, just to give an example. We could have added like two lower or two upper on both sides. We could have done some sort of uh, forcing a, a c -sharp behavior onto our target database, but that would have a big performance cost, because then if we force two upper or two lower, Maybe our indexes don't get used and so on. What I'm trying to say is this idea of trying to mimic to match the C-sharp behavior only goes so far, and at some point we're going to stop. We're going to say, sorry guys, this is the natural de behavior that your database gives you. We cannot go around it without starting to hack things in a way that's going to compromise performance in a very significant way. Let's move on. I'm going to go over a few more translation examples. A bit more complicated, let's say we want all employees where their task count is equal to two. So now we have a related, a related kind of table. There's like a foreign key relationship and all that kind of stuff. Doesn't really matter. So we have something a bit more complicated happening in the where clause. Not sure how many people are aware of you know, how this kind of thing translates, but the natural way to translate it is like this. This is what we call a subquery in SQL. So the where, what you see here, we open a parentheses and we have another query inside. That other query, uh, uh, returns one scalar value. It doesn't return like a table, but just a single count for that employee, and we compare that to two. I'm just showing this because it's a complex thing. We have to transform this thing into that thing. Just as there's no real mismatch here, per se, but it's, it's a complicated task. And we're also going to need this example in my next thing. The next thing is instance equality. This is another weird mismatch that you're going to see. Let's say we have this code here, employees where the employee is equal to their boss. So basically, we're asking who here is their own boss, right? I guess like anybody who doesn't work in a big company like Microsoft, <laughs> basically. Uh, so this kind of query is weird if we try to translate it into something like a database. An employee here, employees corresponds to a table, which means that a, a single employee corresponds to a row in that table. If we try to just translate this naively, we're kind of asking to compare rows. There's no such thing in relational databases. There's no idea of a customer or an employee or anything of that sort. There's only rows and columns. So the, the idea here does not translate at all. What we're asking in the C-Shop world is basically to compare references, right? A thing, an employee here, let's say it's a normal, uh, you know, a normal um, reference type in C-Shop, is identified by their reference. So we're doing reference equality. The, uh, the corresponding thing in the SQL world is, this is what I'm looking for, is to compare IDs. So in the relational world, there is an idea of an identity. In C Sharp, it's the reference. In the SQL world, it's the key, the primary key. So what we have to do here is translate this equality 
into this kind of thing in SQL. Note that this is happening because we're comparing the actual instance. This is not a property in the employee. It's the employee itself. This is the key. This is why this is complicated. This is the thing that does not translate to SQL. Okay? So this is instance or entity equality if you speak the EF core kind of language, which I'm trying to avoid a little bit. Note that the same thing happens even if we replace boss, this, uh, this thing here, we can replace it with a subquery. For example, the employees where their first task is equal to some x. Note that in general, if you put a first, you also have to put an order by, but I'm glossing over a little bit because I don't want to make it too complicated. There's also an ordering mismatch between C-sharp and, and, and you know, the relational world. And we get this thing where this compli arbitrarily complicated subquery, soon you'll see where I'm building to, dot id1 is equal to x dot id1. Everybody's clear about this? We're just playing games with you know, translation. I'm going to take this two steps further. In the relational world, something can have what's called a composite key. This is very foreign to C Sharp. In C Sharp, you have a reference, that's the, that's the identity, that's the identifier, but in the database, you could have two columns as your primary key, as your identifier. So, okay, fine, that's not so difficult, right? All you have to do is write something like this. So now when we translate that thing, we look, we see, oh, that thing has two columns, two keys, two key properties, so we're gonna do an AND between them. Clear, right? Again, not, not, nothing to write home about. But then, if we combine the whole thing, with a, again, with the subquery, I'm just reminding this, then we'll get this SQL right here. So we'll have this SQL here, which is that, that SQL that represents the, the tasks. We'll have it here once again. We have to duplicate it because there is a composite key. So the combination of a subquery plus a composite key plus instance equality yields something which we call the double evaluation. This subquery is going to actually execute twice in the database, and that's going to be quite horrible for performance. This is a great example of something which is actually translatable, but we don't want to translate it, right? It's like it's what we sometimes call a pit of failure. Somebody will stumble into it, they won't even know, their SQL will be horribly inefficient. Okay, so this is the kind of problem that we have when we translate between these two languages or domains which are really quite different. Moving on, there's two more, kind of, two more things and then we're gonna dive into actual architecture. So related instances is basically we have employees and the employees have tasks, right? The tasks are available on the employees. When we're in linked to objects, we're in C Sharp, there's just a reference there, right? So an instance of an employee has a reference to a, lot of, uh, to a list of tasks or whatever. But when we're now gonna fetch something from the database, we don't simply have those tasks. We have to choose whether to fetch them or not. The fact that, some, that a user wants to have all the employees doesn't mean that they necessarily want to also have the tasks for each employee. It's a very different situation, right? We need for the user to tell us exactly what related stuff they want to bring back from the database. Otherwise, once again, we're going to bring a lot of useless stuff that they're not going to use. Network bandwidth, database uh, uh, load, a lot of performance problems. So in EF Core, for those who haven't used it ever, we've devised, we basically invented an operator. This is not rocket science, but we have something that is not part of link called include. This is our own thing. It looks a little bit like a link operator, but it is not. It's a way for you guys to signal to us that yes, get the employees, but get them along with their tasks. It's a way of communicating with EF, with the ORM, to tell what you want. It doesn't make any sense in, in, the, in the memory world, right? Because the tasks are just there, okay? This will generate this SQL right here. So this naturally will produce a join, in this case, a left join. Now, it's, it's worth uh, stressing that this is actually very new behavior in EF Core 3. If you do this exact thing, in earlier versions of EF, you're gonna get something very different. Instead of having one query with a join, you're gonna get multiple queries. So you're gonna get two, in this case, two queries. One for the employees, one for their tasks. It's a radically different way to translate the exact same user request. Get me the employees, get me their tasks. There's advantages and disadvantages to both. The problem with the multiple queries is exactly that. It's multiple round trips to the database. So if you're including uh, 10 things, then we're doing 10 round trips to the database, 
Okay, that's one disadvantage. On the other hand, this kind of query with a left join, anybody who's done database knows about a phenomenon, the so-called Cartesian explosion. When you do a relational join, um, as you're adding more and more joins, various column data gets duplicated across the rows. I'm not going to go into this because those of you who know databases know, those who don't, it's not worth really going into. Um, the point here is that no solution is exactly perfect. Each has its advantages or dis and disadvantages. One additional important thing that's problematic with the uh, multiple round trips is transactionality. If we send one query for the employees, another query for the tasks, maybe the database has changed. Maybe somebody has already updated something in between and we get a mismatch, we get an inconsistent view. That's about transactionality. So that's a good reason to say one link query is better translated as one SQL query. It maintains transactionality, coherency, and all that kind of stuff, all right? Another point is that it is still possible today, of course, to write your query in a way that's actually gonna perform multiple queries if this is what you want. For example, if you have like 10 joins that you need to do, it's probably a bad idea to do this with 10 joins because that's gonna do this dreaded Cartesian explosion. So you can rewrite your queries. If you look on our site, you can rewrite them in a way that won't produce this. In the old world, there was actually no real way, it was much more difficult, or let's say there was no way to actually produce a join. So in the new world, you can have both, you just have to be explicit about it, but by default, we're gonna produce this. So just zooming out again, it's another case of, there's, there's really two possible translations in behavior of how to you know, do the thing that you asked, and each of them has its advantages and disadvantages. The last thing with translation, is untranslatability. That's another important thing that also changed in 3.0. Let's say we have something like this. Employees where, and then some function that returns a Boolean on E. How do we translate this? So the answer is it depends. Some function, some func, might be something that we can actually translate. There are a lot of functions that we know how to translate. If you, for example, you, you, if you run uh, like a C-sharp substring function, this is something that we know how to translate into SQL because SQL typ typically databases also have a substring kind of function that works the same way. But in some ways, we don't know this function, we have no idea. So then what happens? In older versions, you would, we would translate to the server if we can. Otherwise, we would evaluate on the client. So EF Core 2.2, 2.1 had what's called client evaluation. We would transparently, automatically, just evaluate it here. All right, it's a cool feature because it means you know you, you do your link and whatever we can will execute on the server and whatever we can will bring the data and execute it here. Of course, this has some problems. <laughs> Maybe some of you have already hit this. This can bring a lot of data to the client. So once again, if some func, just to make sure everybody understands, if some func is translatable, we send it in the SQL to the database, the database does it and returns only the rows that matched. If some func is not translatable, we are gonna download that whole friggin' table to the client, and then we're gonna apply that function because that's the only thing we can do. The difference between these two is non-manifest. If I look at this query, I have no idea what's gonna happen. Depends. Depends on if that function is translatable on my database provider. Maybe tomorrow I try to run, I was on SQL Server, now I try on Postgres, suddenly the whole thing changes, okay? This uh, is particularly uh, dangerous because this is typically a problem that you find when switching from testing to production. Because in testing, you have a small data set, you're, you're running your tests, so everything is fine. Then you push this thing to production, and suddenly your table is huge, so you're transferring like, I don't know, a gigabyte of table data to the client, boom, application crashes. This actually happened. Another more subtle issue is that adding a new translation can break behavior. What does this mean? If today some func is something we cannot translate, we bring the data and we do client evaluation, great. Let's say tomorrow we add a new feature. It's a cause for celebration, right? It's like a new feature for EF Core. That means that all of a sudden you upgrade and instead of bringing the data and executing C-sharp code, we now send a SQL that does it on the server side. The behavior as we've seen is gonna maybe be slightly different because in the database it's not gonna be a 100% exact same behavior as at the client. And suddenly, the behavior has changed. So it sort of started making it, it made it impossible for us to make a change while being sure that there's no breaking change involved. And this is why, because of these issues, EF Core 3 throws. 
if we cannot translate, we just don't do it. The only exception is in the topmost projection. So if you have a select at the very end, that's like a top a topmost projection, then we allow a client evaluation because the data is coming anyway to the client. There's no danger in doing client evaluation. But I'm not, not going to talk about this anymore. All right. What did we learn from, we talked about like four or five cases. We, we've learned that there are many, many mismatches between C Sharp and, and uh, C Sharp Link and SQL. It does not translate well. These are two different worlds, different rules. Nulls are not the same. Nothing is the same, basically. It seems like it's very easy. It really is not, unfortunately. We also learned that ORMs have to make big decisions. Uh, these decisions are not, it's not like a straightforward thing. It's not obvious what we should do. There are decision points with pros and cons to each way that we decide to go. It's, 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 quite, it's quite hard, and it's very, very hard to satisfy everybody, by the way. Each, each one of our users has their own like, idea of what they need and so on, and they're used to doing things in a certain way. It's a big headache, I'll just say. Um, and uh, we need to do many things to expression trees before they can, before they can get converted. Okay, so let's zoom out. How are we going to actually do this thing? So uh, the query pipeline that we're going to build, it has inputs and outputs. So the input is a link expression tree that we get from an I queryable. What are the outputs for a relational database? One is a SQL, obviously. And the second one is a shaper or materializer, which is a component that's going to read back all those results. Remember that I said in the beginning. These are our inputs and outputs for this component. What we are basically doing is, in a sort of way, building a compiler, right? Taking an expression tree from one language, which represents C Sharp, and, build, and basically compiling it into a sort of SQL. We actually use that word internally, so it's actually an interesting thing. What does the architecture of such a thing look like? The query engine, what we call the query pipeline, is architected as a pipeline of visitors. Each visitor is a sort of component that is going to traverse the expression tree that we get from Link and does exactly one thing, one of these massaging operations, manipulations that we just talked about, that you will see is necessary. So let's take a look a little bit at what a visitor looks like in this architecture. It's quite important. For example, this instance equality, remember what we said? It has a very simple job. It traverses the entire tree. It attempts to identify places where we're, we're doing equality between instances. And when it finds those, it's going to replace those expressions by expressions doing equality over their keys. I hope that's clear. That's a one job description for one visitor in our pipeline. Oop. Let's take a look at a very uh, minimal kind of exercise of what a visitor actually looks like. I'm going to kind of, I, I need to, do a, to speed up a little bit, so this might be a little bit brief. But let's say that what we want to do, we have this kind of query where C age is larger than 18 and C name is not equal to null. But we know that C name is actually a non-nullable column in the database. There's no need to check to generate SQL that asks whether it's not null. We know that it cannot be null. So we want to simplify this, optimize this to this. So we're going to show, we're going to see in a very quick way how to write something like this. So we have a base class called an expression visitor in C sharp. This is a standard class. The default behavior of this thing is basically to traverse the entire tree and to do nothing. What we are going to do, we're going to override one method, one type of expression that interests us. We're going to basically hook into all binary expressions. And what this method returns is what is going to replace that binary expression in the tree. This is a very common pattern called visitation. So I'm not going to go too much into detail here, but basically we identify nodes which are of type not equal. We're looking for non-equality nodes. If we find those, we check if the right side is a constant, and that constant is null, and the left side is not nullable. I'm basically identifying the exact case that I want to optimize. And in that case, I'm going to return a constant of true. So what I did is replace what you just saw before into something that looks very weird. C age is larger than 18, and true. OK? I hope it's kind of clear what, what just happened here. This went over the entire tree, identified this specific case, and replaced it with a true. It's one component. Because we want to get rid of that true as well, we have another visitor that identifies and also. And also is basically a logical and. And once it finds on the right side a, a constant, which is of type bool, and that bool is true, then it's going to return the left side. All right, so it's going to replace this ridiculous expression with just the left side, which is the part that interests us, and we get this. To recap, we have this 
expression that came in. One visitor made it into this, and another visitor made it into this. This is exactly how the whole thing is architected. If you look at an actual, this is an actual code fragment from EF Core inside. What you see at some point is this chain of visitors. There's a lot of visitors. Each one gets a query, visits, does something, returns. We pass to the next one, returns. The next one returns. Each one has its own function. We even have the entity equality rewriting expression visitor. That's the one that I just described before. It looks like this. It's a chain of visitors. And slowly, we transform the expression in some way. Now, up to now, we've dealt with these expression trees from link. But at some point, we want to start to get close to something that resembles an actual SQL query. This is our destination. So we're going to transform this into a model of a SQL query. No longer where order by in the link sense. Now we want to talk about an actual SQL kind of thing. So if we look at this tree, sorry, this query right here. So there's a where, a filter, an order by, a take, and a select. The expression tree representation without any sort of change is this. Looks a bit weird, maybe. But you see the topmost method is this select. It has two parameters, take. These are all extension methods, right? So this operates on the output of take and applies this selector to it, this projection. Take gets the output of order by, and so on and so forth, until the DB set, which represents our table. This is the link expression tree. But what we want at some point is something that represents the SQL that we're going to actually do which is something more like this. This is a select expression that has nothing to do with this select, even though the name is the same. It has a projection, several projections, name and age. It has a predicate. It has uh, you know, the take, and it has an order by. So this is now starting to be something, a different model of expression trees that is starting to resemble what we actually want to generate. It's worth mentioning here that we still are talking about expressions and expression trees, but now we're talking about SQL-specific ones. The select expression that I just showed, that's a SQL expression. Another good example of this, if you look at this kind of query here, uh, what, what we are asking is to get me all the customers whose ID is either one, two, or three, where this array contains this ID. We can translate this in SQL to this kind of thing, where CID in one, two, three. SQL has this kind of expression, which obviously C Sharp does not. It would be nice to have it one day. Behind the scenes, this is actually represented via something called a SQL in expression. What this shows you is that expression trees can also have custom types, which you can invent yourselves. You can actually mix them up. It's a very kind of interesting model, which you can actually do. Uh, yeah. I'll just I'll move on a little bit. This is also, by the way, the point where providers, different database providers or drivers, and user translations kick in. So if you want to check whether the, the length of a column is greater than 5, on SQL Server, it's going to be one function. On Postgres, it's going to be called a completely different function. And you can also yourself define a function and say what it's going to translate into as a SQL fragment or as a SQL expression. All right. We're pretty much at the end of the line of what this looks like. So there's a bit more massaging and post-processing of this, this thing, okay? of this, this expression tree that's been abused and changed and modified in various ways. At the end of this line, what we have is yet another visitor, the query, the, the query SQL generating uh, visitor. This is just another visitor that walks over our expression tree, which now resembles an actual SQL query, and generates, just has a string builder and generates an actual SQL query. So this is the thing that generates SQL. And there's another one that will generate the materializer or the shaper, which means it's basically generating code via expression trees for something that's going to take the results coming back from that SQL and materializing them into your actual objects. All right? Quick schema. So this is we're starting to build out what this looks like. The expression tree goes in. It has a pre-processing phase. Now here we're still in link kind of expression trees. Then boom, we have a translation point. Now we've shifted into a SQL model expression tree. Then we have a bit of post-processing. And let's say the two outputs are the SQL and the shaper. This is obviously a simplification of what actually goes on, right? This is it's a 45-minute talk. <laughs> OK, let's, let's go and talk a little bit about perf. Uh, I don't have that much time. We'll see where, where, where we can get with this. So the first important thing, I'm going to do a small segue before I come back to this. The first thing that you need to know is that we have uh, a very two completely different types of queries. They look very, very similar. The first one, we are getting all the posts where the title contains .netos. The string .netos is embedded as a literal, as a constant inside that query. 
In contrast, the second query, which looks the same, has a variable, which is coming from the outside. We translate this in very different ways. The first one is going to have, you know, it's not a surprise, it's going to have the literal actually embedded inside, whereas the second one has this weird thing, which is a parameter placeholder. Again, for people who are not familiar with SQL, typically you're going to have a SQL, and it, there's going to be a parameter inside, and you're going to run the same SQL with different parameter values. This is usually the way things work. Why is this so important? Because this allows you to have one idea of a query where there's a placeholder, you've identified the place where the actual values are going to change all the time. It's important for if core. It's important because there's only going to be one query behind the scenes. It's important for your database, which has a query cache, prepared statements. This is a major, major part of performance. It's very important. Now, let's go back to this pipeline. This is the actual optimization which I, I wanted to show. So compilation, this whole thing that I just showed you with this big string of visitors and all that is extremely slow. If we actually run these visitors, this whole pipeline, with all these visitors on every single query, that thing would grind to a halt. It's super long. No way we can run this every time. So what do we do whenever we have a performance problem? Always the same answer. We have to apply some form of caching, right? When it's not you know, some intrinsics or some low-level thing, basically we just have to cache things like we do everywhere else. So the inputs, whenever we cache, we ask what's the input, what's the output? The input is an expression tree, and the output, once again, SQL and Shaper. All right? So how do we do this thing? When we get a query like this, okay, the first time that we get it, so we have this expression tree, we go through the entire pipeline and we do this whole compilation process that's very expensive. And at the end, we're going to actually cache this expression tree. The next time that we get an expression tree, we're going to do a structural comparison, which means we're going to actually walk this tree and compare each node. So we're going to make sure that they are exactly the same. That's very, very important. It's kind of a bummer because it's very slow, right? I mean, it seems very slow. We'll talk, if I have some time, we'll talk about you know, what we can do with this. But this is the basic thing that we're going to do. There's one, one more step that's kind of important. I'm just going to go really quickly over this. In situations where we have a parameterized query, we first have to walk over this thing, find where there's a parameter, because the parameter is going to be different each time, and replace it with a placeholder. So we're going to punch holes, so to speak, inside our tree. And at that point, after we've parameterized, we've removed these parameters, then we have trees which are structurally identical and can be compared for caching. I hope that point is clear. If not, it's not the end of the world. It's not that important. And what we have now for the query pipeline is something like this. We have the expression tree going through parameter extraction. So this, we go over the thing. We find those parameters, and we punch those holes. We extract them out. At that point, we're going to check, is it cached? The first time, it's not cached. So we're going to go into what's called compilation. This is the compiler. This is really the EF core compiler. The outputs from this whole thing after preprocessing, translation, post-processing is SQL and a shaper, as always. The next time that the same structural query comes in, maybe with a different parameter, it's going to go through expression tree, parameter extraction. We're going to ask, is this thing cached? And the answer is going to be yes this time. Okay, So we've bypassed this whole thing. This is important because it allows us to maintain a compilation pipeline. We don't have to worry about speed that much in the compilation pipeline. This is no longer our hot path. We don't have to be crazy uh, you know, about making it run fast because we have a caching layer before it anyway. However, if we're really like hyper-minded people, which we are because we're in .NET OS, every time we still have to do the parameter extraction, even if it's cached. We still have to do parameter extraction. We, you, obviously, there's a dictionary for the cache, so we have to do a hash code calculation over the entire tree, which is super non-cheap. And then we, when we actually do the structural comparison, do it several times until we find that tree that matches, or sorry, or we don't find it. So there's an answer to this as well. Okay, and if we don't want to do this, if we're super hyper-minded, we can use a feature called compile queries. In order to show how this works, I first have to show how how we actually run a query without compile queries. So this is just a very small thing. In EF Core, in general, there's something called a context. You can think as the co of the context as basically kind of like your database connection to vastly simplify things. So you have to use your context when you actually want to run your query. Your query runs, you see this link query, runs on the context in the end. Okay. So this is a non-compiled query. This is the thing that's going to go through the whole pipeline. Maybe through the caching, maybe not. But you can also use the compiled query feature, which does something completely different. I'm going to use a special API called ef.compileQuery. Okay. I'm going to put the same lambda inside here. 
And I'm going to get back a func that accepts a context, an instance of a context, say again, a database connection, a parameter, and the thing that it returns. Just look at how I use it, and it's going to become abundantly clear. I have a thing, a ready-made function, that I simply call. I pass the parameter, the, sorry, the context as a parameter. I pass the actual ID of the post that I want, and I get that thing. What we've just done is bypassed the whole beginning of the query pipeline, which is parameter extraction, caching, blah, 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 blah. So this is basically kind of like the ultimate performance you can get to. I hope that's, that's kind of clear. Um, at this point, I'm just going to say some closing words. This is, I pretty much managed to do what I wanted. So what did we learn about this? from this kind of talk. So an ORM is obviously a very complex thing. I'm amazed. I, I, I've been doing this um, like inside the EF core pipeline itself. I've been doing it for several months. I've been working on databases and, and so on for a long time. But actually doing this stuff, it's incredibly complex. Just be aware when you're cursing at your ORM because it's not doing exactly what you want. Everybody hates ORMs. Just be aware how difficult the job is. It really is quite difficult. Uh, it's always important, once again, going back to that quote, be aware of what's happening one layer underneath you. I, I hope that I managed to get some concepts across with regards to perf and caching to understand a little bit how EF Core works. There are some mistakes which make it extremely inefficient, so it's worth knowing about this. And always, always look at the SQL being generated under the hood. Never trust anything, definitely not an ORM. Okay? One thing I have to say, so the actual heroes of this story is, first of all, Smith Patel, which is the architect of the new query pipeline um, for uh, 3.0. Again, it got rewritten, a huge undertaking, and uh, it's, it's really quite uh, mind-boggling that we managed to do this. So this is largely his work. And also Maurizio Markovsky, who is also another part of the query pipe, the guys working on the query pipeline, also a Polish guy. So deserves a mention. And of course, the entire EF team, everybody kind of interacts with the, with the query pipeline because it's such a central component. And with that, thank you very much for listening. Um, thanks. <laughs> this, if you're interested in the presentation, you can go to uh, my blog and it's, it's there. You can watch it. So yeah, it's, it's basically already online. Uh, we've got a time for one question from the audience. Amazing. OK, here. Uh, raise your hand. If you want to ask uh, Shai something more, he will be with us during the break. Of course. Also after. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I have a question about uh, caching uh, compiled queries because I think that I've heard of. A, um, I think it's a new feature, but I'm not sure if it's if it's, re if it's really if I uh, heard correctly that there is a way of. Uh, caching uh, queries, uh, not in runtime, but in sort of a, of a uh, build phase of a project and save the cache output in some form of a text file or something like that uh, so that it's not uh, compiled during runtime. Is that, is that uh, Entity Framework core feature? No. We'd love to have this. This is one of the things we are uh, dreaming about, actually, is to take the whole compilation thing offline to do it ahead of, basically, we're talking about compilation, right? This is a JIT, what you've just seen. So you run your program, and when the query is needed, it, it gets JITed. And what you've just described is an AOT approach to an ORM, to a query compiler. It's amazing how these concepts map well to the world of compilers, JITs, and AOT, and all this. To answer your question, EFCore doesn't have this, this feature at all at the moment. We really hope that we do have it. Uh, having said that, yes, it means that, uh, like with general, like the whole point of JIT, the, it's the same point. The problem is startup. So you're doing this only once. It's important to understand. If your program is well written, you have a startup time that's going to be long because you're compiling all your queries. And from that time, the stable state, again, this is the way we talk also in the JIT world, the stables, we've reached stable state, and we don't have to compile anything anymore. Unless you've done something like dynamically generate queries which are different every single time, and then you're compiling all the time. And that's a very, very faulty design. So I'd love to, I, I, there's still a lot of value in what you ask for, and it's not there yet. Ladies and gentlemen, Shai Rudzianski, thank you very much. Thank you.